Welcome. My name is Forrest Longman, and I am the president of City Club. The mission of City Club is to inform, connect, and engage our community to strengthen the civic health of our region. We emphasize civil conversations and listening to others. We begin by acknowledging with humility that the land where we are today is the territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people, and it has been this way since time immemorial. As always, I'd like to thank all the volunteers who make our programs possible. I'd also like to thank KMRE radio board member Robert Clark, who's producing today's program, and BTV10, who will be broadcasting it to their viewers. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for their support. They are Bruce and Claudia Deesend, the Opportunity Council, Baron Smith Doggart, Attorneys at Law, Colshan CPAs, Danny Neal of the Moliat Group, Unity Care Northwest, Pacific Continental Realty, Western Top Washington University, Wacom Community College, Village Books, and the Firehouse Arts and Events Center. Our next City Club meeting in September will be the second of our series of political forums this election season, and it will feature the candidates for the State House of Representatives in the 40th and 42nd districts. Finally, I'd like to introduce Christine Perkins. She's the Executive Director of the Whatcom County Library System, a member of our program committee, and will be moderating today's program. Christine? Thank you, Forrest. We're covering two races this afternoon, so I'm going to just jump right in. The first half of our forum, we will focus on the Public Utility District Number 1 of Whatcom County, and then we will switch gears and speak to candidates for the Washington State Senate District 42. We will ask each candidate a series of questions. We will alternate which candidate goes first for each question. The candidates will have 90 seconds to answer, and they may begin when the timer screen turns green. When the screen turns yellow, they have 15 seconds to remain, uh, finish their remaining response. And when the screen turns red, they must stop. We're going to begin with several questions prepared by members of the City Club Programming Committee. And then we will field questions from you, our audience members. So again, please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Are both of our candidates uh, clear on how the process will unfold this morning? Feeling ready to go? Okay, great. Uh, both of our candidates have agreed to be referred to by their first name, so that makes it simple for us here. Um, we have Jamie Arnett and Eric Davidson today. Um, so for the PUD race, we'll begin in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, so we'll start our first question with Jamie. Jamie, what about your previous experience and background makes you feel that you are well suited to serve on the PUD? Why are you interested in running for this office? I'm interested in running for this office to serve my community. Um, the majority of the work that I've done professionally is um, in nonprofit management as a service to my community, both for Habitat for Humanity and Animals as Natural Therapy, where I'm currently the executive director providing animalist assisted therapy um, to youth and veterans. So I, I run a small therapy farm. I also have a background um, as an executive in the commercial fishing industry, um, which provides me sort of a unique balance um, when dealing with water issues um, between, you know, water that's necessary for um, the fishing industry and water that's necessary for the agricultural um, uh, industry. Um, I have executive level leadership um, and it, definitely when dealing with transition, something that our PUD is certainly going through right now, um, transitioning um, from a new GM. Um, I have uh, over a decade's experience um, in contract grant writing, um, exploring different funding opportunities for community-based organizations to achieve their financial goals and better serve our community. Um, so that, that's why I'm interested in running. I want to be a service to the community that I live in. Super, thank you. Now we'll turn to Eric and I'll repeat the question. Eric, what are your previous experience? What about your previous experience and background makes you well suited to serve on the PUD? Why are you interested in running for this office? Well, I'm, I'm interested in continuing to serve 
you know, the people of Whatcom County and um, the infrastructure of Whatcom County. Uh, part of part of what uh, my experience is, is, um, you know, I, I was raised uh, by my father, who was an electrician, who worked for a public utility. And I remember uh, a number of times talking about the pluses and minuses of, of public utilities and how they work and, and what they do. He built substations for, you know, 25 years. And so you kind of get an understanding of, of a bigger picture. Um, and then uh, once I moved to Whatcom County, I, uh, I got on the public works board here in Whatcom County about 10 years ago and have been working with um, public works in Blaine for a long time. And Blaine, you know, they own their own uh, electrical, sewer, wastewater um, utilities. So we really worked a lot on, you know, day-to-day -day -day work and big picture stuff, especially with all the growth in Blaine. Um, and then about six years ago, I was elected to the city council. And then I was um, uh, reelected uh, a year and a half ago or so, a year ago. Uh, and so between the 10 years of working with the city council and and the public utilities and and really trying to look at the big picture i i think i'm i think i've got some really good experience as well as almost 20 years executive experience in the military as well all right thank you so for the second question we're going to start with eric this time <clears throat> the question is uh the the pud along with bellingham lummi nation and nooksack tribe has one of the largest water rights in the county as a major player, what role should the PUD play in regards to water? Well, I mean, I think, I think when you talk about, I think when you talk about um, public utilities, I mean, water is a first and foremost, right? Um, I, I think they need to play a really active role, um, uh, under understanding that they can be in a lot of ways a coordinator for a lot of different municipalities. Um, as, as well as have an understanding of, of the tribes and the tribal uh, treaties that are and who's, who's first in water rights. Um, I, think, I think in the long run with all the growth uh, in Whatcom County and everything that's, that's pro projected to go on in the next 10 to 20 years, we've got we've to make some, some hard looks at uh, long-term how we're gonna deal with water. And, uh, to have the PUD being proactive uh, in the approach to water, whether whether that proactivity is conservation at the residential level or figuring out maybe a better way to um, to to irrigate, uh, dealing with um, uh, reservoirs uh, to to hold water when we when we need it. I think I think in the long term, uh, there's a number of ways that the PUD can really uh, take hold and be a leader um, for the rest of the counties, for the rest of the county, for Bellingham, for the smaller municipalities. And I, I think they can take a real active role um, in water conservation and water management. Okay, thank you. Jamie, I'll repeat the question. The PUD, along with Bellingham, Lummi Nation, and Nooksack Tribe, has one of the largest water rights in the county. As a major player, what role should the PUD play regarding water? Thank you. Yeah, water is precious and Whatcom County is facing a number of complex water rights and water quantity issues. And while there's actually no shortage of technical solutions, it's been really difficult to get all players to the table to discuss um, the future of water availability. Um, I think that um, the PUD needs to comply with, um, with the adjudication process, which is currently happening. The state legislature funded it and we're in the pre-adjudication process right now. Unfortunately, um, adjudication can take a number of years. Uh, Ecology is putting in that at 10 to 20 years. I think Yakima, it took 40. So we need to proactively be seeking solutions um, to conserve water in Whatcom County. And there's a number of ways that the PUD can do that. Um, there was a study put out by the Nooksack tribe on how changing forestry practices upriver can actually increase in-stream flows by 50%. I think we need to look at that. Um, the uh, PUD also has a large and senior water right on the main stem of the Nooksack River. 
And, um, and that's a, a, an area where we're not as concerned with in-stream flows from, from a salmon habitat perspective. So I think it would be wise for the PUD to use that um, to help agriculture customers. They can pipe water um, to agricultural customers. Um, we can help set up um, water banks, um, transfer water rights. I think there's a number of ways the PUD can help. Okay. For our next question, we'll start with Jamie again. How could the PUD partner with other governments on climate change, water resources allocation, or broadband? When is it appropriate for the PUD to take the lead versus other jurisdictions? I, I, I think that um, we should be partnering with other organizations and other government entities whenever possible. I think, um, you know, with broadband, when it comes to broadband, we need to work with um, the port um, to to get broadband out to um, all of Whatcom County. Um, when it comes to water issues specifically, we really need to work closely with Lummi Nation. Um, the Treaty of Point Elliot um, secured hunting and fishing rights for um, our local tribes, and we have a legal and ethical obligation to ensure that they have enough water to maintain salmon habitat. So we need to be working closely with the tribe to ensure that we need to be working closely with um, with agriculture, with perhaps the Farm Bureau to ensure that there's enough water. Um, I think that it's it's in our best interest to work with, um, you know, have as many interlocal agreements when it comes to getting broadband out. Um, I think that um, when deploying broadband, we could be looking at the city of Blaine and maybe the city of Sumas who already have um, municipal electric to help them get municipal broadband. Um, they already own the infrastructure. Uh, I think there's a number of ways that uh, the PUD needs to proactively work with other government um, agencies. Thank you. Eric, let me repeat the question for you. How could the PUD partner with other governments on climate change, water resources allocation, or broadband? When is it appropriate for the PUD to take the lead versus other jurisdictions? Well, I, I agree with Jamie in a lot of ways, right? Uh, the the uh, collaboration between municipalities, between um, farm bureaus, between the tribes, um, and in some cases, private industry, other counties working hard uh, to, to get help from Olympia in the budget process. All those things are huge. In, in Blaine in the last three to five years, there's been a big push. And especially with COVID, there's been a big push to work with the other small cities, uh, as well as Bellingham is starting to come to small cities um, programs. And we exponentially as a group can get so much more done if we're working together. Um, I, I think there's, uh, a, a good solution where people can be a win-win in many cases versus the, the clash of one municipality to another or one organization to another. Um, as far as broadband, I'm a, I'm a firm supporter in broadband um, for everybody. And I would love to see, uh, I would love to see broadband and Blaine all over the place. Uh, it's a difficult thing. That's something we've been wrestling with in Blaine specifically because we have pockets that are kind of not in, in great spots currently. But I would love to see uh, I would love to see 100 percent with broadband and I'd love to see PUD taking the lead. And I know they've been working hard for a lot of grants for that. Uh, and I would love to see for folks who maybe couldn't afford broadband to work uh, to, to have programs in place through all the different organizations that can help help supplement that. So. Great, thank you. Before we move to our next question, I just want to remind the audience members that you may uh, enter. Uh, questions and answers in the Q&A field. Um, please specify if your questions are for our PUD candidates or for our Senate candidates. And to our candidates, don't feel like you need to check the Q&A. Um, I will be using those to ask those questions to you out loud. So you don't need to uh, be worried about that in any way. I will follow up. Um, okay. Uh, we have, uh, now we're gonna move to a question where Eric will start. And the question is, the PUD is studying the feasibility of taking over electricity service from PSE. 
what criteria would you use to decide whether to stay with PSE or to develop a Whatcom County Municipal Electric System? That's, a, that's actually a really good question. And that's actually something that we're wrestling with in um, Blaine right now, the future of, of our infrastructure, specifically our electric um, with all the growth going on, the, the, the kind of the growing pains that we're dealing with. Um, I, I think, I think that the more local control that, uh, that we can have in Whatcom County or in city of Bellingham, um, I think, I think the better. Uh, but, you know, this is just not a matter of deciding how much poles and copper is worth and writing a check and taking it over. Uh, there's a lot that goes into uh, taking over a municipality, and if done wrong, it can be very bad. You know, in, in, in the long run, you have to look to see, is this going to be in the best interest of uh, the taxpayers, the environment, and the overall economy? Uh, because even though in theory it might be nice to have it one way, we've got to look at the bigger picture. If if taking over a specific if taking over electrical doubles the rate, what does that do to the taxpayer? It doubles the rate. Does it um, does it help the environment? Not necessarily if we're not as efficient at it. Um, as well as what about all the the businesses, all the places that are trying to to all the factories that goes right against the you know, job creation. Um, so there's a lot to look at, but I would certainly be in favor of, of local control. I'm a, I'm a local control guy over Olympia or the big picture. So thank you. Thank you. So Jamie, I'll repeat the question for you. The PUD is studying the feasibility of taking over electricity services from PSE. What criteria would you use to decide whether to stay with PSE or to develop a Whatcom County Municipal Electrical System? Thank you. Yeah, so like Eric, I think that that local control is is better. I do like the idea of having um, municipal electric. I grew up, grew up in Blaine, where we do have municipal electricity. It's cheaper in Blaine. It's all we have better service in Blaine. Um, I think a feasibility study should focus on a couple of things. I think there should be a rate study to um, to see if it's affordable um, for not just every citizen, but our, our lowest income citizens. Uh, Jefferson County actually did this. They switched to um, countywide electric and they ended up with much higher base charges, uh, which is a serious issue for low income families. Um, I think that we could learn something from the Jefferson County um, in, in their transition. I also think a rate study should focus on job creation. Um, any feasibility study that's done should, should see, you know, how many jobs can be created locally um, for that switch. Uh, I think that, um, again, it, it would be wonderful to have the local control, but I would be um, hesitant to, to just make that jump. And I also think that we can focus on um, other, other alternative electric sources in Whatcom County um, when, when talking about a switch <laughs> to um, municipal electrics stuff like community solar or creating power from piped water. Um, I think there's a lot of ways. Thank you for your abrupt stop. I appreciate the <laughs> integrity there. Um, okay, but you are going to be our first uh, answerer for the next question, Jamie. Uh, how would you get the PUD to move more quickly regarding broadband access? What is the PUD's role in comparison to the port's role? Oh, that's a great question. I think that I echo everyone's frustration um, that if I see another, you know, community survey without any action, um, I'm going to scream. Um, I think that the PUD is actually making good moves, though. You know, I sat through um, they had Kitsap County come and talk about local utility districts and how that's working in Kitsap. Um, and I think they're making some good movement um, towards developing those, those local utility districts already. Um, I think, again, they should be working with um, local municipalities that already own their electric infrastructure so they can quickly deploy fiber there. Um, I think that it's, it's high time we created a comprehensive dig once 
insurance policy um, so that anytime a ditch is dug, you know, or anytime road work is done, that we're installing that infrastructure alongside it. Um, I don't think that I don't think that fiber is going to be something that happens quickly. Um, I think that um, we need to de deploy the things that we can as fast as we can where we can. Um, it's going to it's going to be a number of um, different ways to get to get fiber installed, and we need to look at all of those. Um, local utility districts won't be the only answer. Municipal uh, broadband won't be the only answer. Um, I think the PUD right now is doing a good job of finding solutions. Thank you. Eric, how would you get the PUD to move more quickly regarding broadband access? What is the PUD's role in comparison to the port's role? Well, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to parrot Jamie. I feel like we've parroted each other on stuff, but it's, she's, she absolutely hit the nail on the head with the, uh, with the dig once program, right. Uh, to put infrastructure in is really difficult. So I just want to say, yeah, dig one is a way to go. Uh, as far as PUD versus, uh, versus a court, there, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of overlap in any of these. There's a lot of overlap with, um, with the, uh, local municipalities, but working together, to uh, minimize that overlap, to, to work as efficiently as possible, I think is um, fantastic. Uh, the, the thought of bringing in uh, to having the discussion with a private entity to see what some of the opportunities might be. Um, with that, though, you know, I'm always I'm always worried about uh, jacking the rates up to the point where it's just not feasible. You have access to it, but you can't afford it. Um, uh, as well as alternatives to just a regular cable line. Um, are there are there satellites and wireless uh, things that can be put in put in place for people that are in um, rural areas? Right. It it may cost it may be cost prohibitive to go out in the middle of the county for 20 people, but it might not be for satellite. Um, so I think we have to look at all the options, and um, we have to make it a priority. Like we've got to have a long-term priority uh, and not, not deviate from the mission on that. Okay, our next question, uh, we'll have Eric start, and this is one from our audience Q&A. If an opposing uh, political action committee publishes false information, will you publicly disavow such a publication? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think what's best for the voters of Whatcom County is to learn what's what's real, you know, um, and uh, I think in our case, that may not be a huge problem. I, I hope not. I hope there's not a lot of false information going out there, but abs absolutely I would. There's no there's no reason for false information. And if I if I support false information um, against Jamie, then it makes me kind of a hypocrite. And, uh, you know, I kind of consider Jamie a friend that I don't want to lose regardless, so. Okay, thank you. So Jamie, what uh, if an opposing political action committee publishes false information, would you publicly disavow such a publication? Yeah, same as Eric, you bet. You know, um, I've actually known Eric for a number of years. We served alongside each other on Blaine City Council. Um, we have a good working relationship. Um, I would never um, allow somebody to publicly malign him and especially um, to further my campaign. Um, I, I do have a campaign code of conduct that is also on my website. Um, I think that we need to play fair. And again, I, I enjoy Eric. Um, you know, I think that he's intelligent and compassionate and I would not allow somebody to malign his name to further my, my candidacy. Thank you both. Okay, I am going to um, go to another audience question. And uh, we'll start with Jamie this time. Um, what roles can microgrids play in building energy resiliency in the face of climate change? Should the PUD build them? 
Wow. I'm, I'm going to be super honest um, and tell you that I actually don't, I don't know much uh, about microgrids. Um, and, and it's, it's not something that I've studied. I can, I can help share sort of my process for when I don't, you know, when I don't know the answer. Um, I like to think that sometimes my opinions on things are less relevant than the, the public's input. Um, you know, my brother works for the Grand Coulee Dam as a as a um, senior operator. He might be a good resource for me to reach out to to talk about microgrids. I did catch the part of the question that's you know talking about climate change. Um, I think that that there are a lot of solutions to electric. Um, that are, are green and we need to certainly be following up with all of those solutions. Like I, I mentioned earlier, um, solar, community solar, um, you know, using uh, power from piped water, um, capturing electric from local dairy biodigesters um, that are already operating here in Washington County and often have to flare. Um, specifically though, I don't know that I can, I can properly answer the question about the microgrid, but I will definitely be looking into it. Okay, I will repeat the same question for Eric. What roles can microgrids play in building energy resiliency in the face of climate change? Should the PUD build them? Um, uh, well, like Jamie, I'm not an expert in microgrids. Um, uh, should, should the PUD build them? I don't know if, if necessarily the PUD should, should build them. I don't know how efficient that is on a on a grand scale for the PUD, but I definitely think the PUD um, could potentially build some and could potentially uh, encourage uh, new development to to do this. Uh, for example, uh, for all new development, I, I don't want to force a contractor to uh, put X number of thousands of dollars of solar on their house. But I do want to give that contractor an incentive to do that, which almost makes it silly not to do that. Um, and the more houses that are built, the more solar that's there. There's no reason that every WTA uh, a bus stop, full bus stop, couldn't have solar on the top. Um, there's no reason, you know, uh, in, in the city of Blaine, one of our biggest customers is a, a marijuana grow operation as far as for uh, electrical use. No reason that that large organization couldn't have solar on top of their whole um, their whole place. And and that could be that could be tax incentives. Uh, that could also be the physical work by the PUD if that's what was needed. But I think those incremental changes, because um, for every 0.1 or 0.2 uh, percentage over the big picture becomes a big number. Okay. We'll move to another question from the audience. Um, and we will start with Eric this time. Eric, uh, you both have given very similar answers to the questions. What do you see as your primary differences with your opponent in terms of how you would perform your work as a PUD commissioner? That's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Jamie is a smart, dedicated person. And um, if I weren't running, I would vote for her, right? Uh, but how we would how we would differ, honestly, I, I think I think we we both want the best for um, Whatcom County over the next five years, over the next 50 years, over the next 500 years, and would make decisions to, to do that. I think the biggest thing for me personally is um, uh, is uh, Jamie has gotten support from um, the Democratic Party, which is which is fine. Um, I I did not talk to the Democratic Party. She, I know she has worked with them before, and and that's fine. But uh, I had the Republican Party reach out to me, and I've decided that that's not something I want to be involved with with either party because this is a um, nonpartisan position, and I've been a real advocate in Blaine. To be nonpartisan and and work that nonpartisan position, so I, I don't feel like I want to want to owe anybody anything and have an agenda. What I want to do is I want to work for a hundred percent of Whatcom County, which I'm sure we both do. But I just I I I just don't like the perception of of of, of the thought that you know Eric has a certain point of view um, because he is linked to a certain group. So. 
Okay, so I'll repeat the question for Jamie. Uh, you both have given very similar answers to the questions. What do you see as your primary differences with your opponent in terms of how you would perform your work as a PUD commissioner? I think, um, I think that I'm very passionate about specifically the water issue in Whatcom County. Um, you know, running a small therapy farm um, and also having worked and grew, growing up in the commercial fishing industry, um, I am constantly worried about um, water quantity, water availability for our future. Um, and, and I think that at the end of the day, passion leads to policy. And, um, and I feel like I have a really vested interest in um, seeing good solutions for our water issues here in Whatcom County. Um, and I think that that does set me apart from Eric. He has a lot of really great experience. Again, we just have nice things to say about each other. He has a lot of really great in, you know, um, experience working you know, with public works on, on council. Um, but I think that he, he may lack that, that passion piece. You know, I'm really here because I wanna see solutions um, for my community. And when I say my community, not just the entirety of the community, but also communities that I grew up in, the fishing community, the farming community. Um, and, and I think that probably sets us apart. And I just want to note that, yes, I am, um, I do have um, endorsements from the Welcome Democrats and the 42nd Legislative Dis District Democrats. But, you know, I also just had dinner with Ben Ellen Boss and his wife. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, another audience question, and this time we'll start with Jamie. Uh, courage and integrity are far more important traits for any elected official than direct knowledge of or stance on any topic. Please describe a time in your life when your courage and or integrity helped you navigate a challenging situation. Yeah, um, that's a great question, and I absolutely agree that courage and integrity are important. Um, I would say, um, you know, I was married <laughs> to someone that had a mental illness and um, we eventually lost him to that mental illness. And, um, you know, today I'm an executive director. I'm doing well. My family is doing well. Um, but there was a point when I had a five-month-old baby standing in line at, um, at the welfare office crying because I didn't know where my husband was and I didn't have any money and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Um, and that was kind of the solid, you know, solid foundation on which I built mine and my son's future. And it took a lot of courage and it took a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication. I used every, every bit of, of help that was made available to me. It was, um, it was, demoralizing in so many ways. And I had to get past that. And, you know, I had a son that I needed to take care of. And, um, you know, that was a time in my life where I had to be create courageous. And I think, I think that it's even courageous to sit here and tell people that little bit about my life, um, about, you know, where I came from. Um, and integrity, you know, I've just gone through a difficult transition at work where I took over for a founder. And that was, really hard and um and and i did have to um i did have to be courageous and i did have to have integrity thank you eric i'll repeat the question for you courage and integrity are far more important traits for any elected official than direct knowledge of or stance on any topic please describe a time in your life when your courage and or integrity help you navigate a challenging situation um, yeah, thank you. And, and I just want to say to start, I've heard this story from Jamie before, and it is kind of an inspiring story. You know, it is neat to see her go from, uh, you know, situations in her life to here. Um, but as far as as far as I go, you know, uh, since I was about 18 years old, um, I had been I had joined the Air Force and in the military, you know, you have to make hard decisions. And you have to be able to stand up to your supervisors and stand up to people who might make your might not make your life easy in order to do the right thing. And I was taught from a young age, even before the military to do the right thing. And I did the right thing through the military. And now as a nurse, um, always taught to do the right thing, always taught to be proactive for the patient. I work in mental health and every day I have to give people um, 
news they don't want to hear, hard news they don't want to hear, and um, have to really work hard to keep them motivated toward things. And then on the city council, um, it, it's almost like when is a day that I don't have to um, make an unpopular decision. Um, uh, with a lot of with a lot of growth going on in Blaine right now, um, and us owning our own utilities, there's a lot of work to be done. There is a lot of uh, there was a lot of um, um, things that weren't done in the last 20 years that we've been working on the last five. And so every day I sit down and I say, which unpopular decision do I have to make today? But what decision is it that's going to be best for the community? And I do that all the time. Okay, thank you. We have another question from the audience. What sorts of activities do the candidates do in their spare time and how could these habits interfere with your ability to represent the constituents? That, that's a good question. Well, in my spare time, I um, go to city council meetings and I talk to people uh, uh, with the city. Um, I uh, walk my dogs and I'm trying to get my lawn looking like I want. Right now in my spare time, I'm spending it um, helping to rehab my wife who just had hip surgery six days ago. So we uh, just got back from PT and I logged on. So uh, in the long haul, that won't be something I'll be doing forever. But no, I don't, I, I, I won't, there won't be a lot that will take me away from um, my, primary, my primary duty as PD commissioner. Um, if you count walking your dogs for 30 minutes a day is a problem, so. Okay, thank you. Jamie, I'll repeat the question. What sort of activity uh, do you do in your spare time and how could these habits interfere with your ability to represent your constituents? Uh, in my spare time, I am a full-time mother to a 12-year-old boy um, and I'm a dog mom to a two-year-old Labradoodle. Um, I don't see um, being a mother as taking away from you know, my potential duties um, with the PUD, but rather a boon, you know, I am concerned for my son's future. Um, every day I'm concerned for his future. I want him to be able to fish in the nooksack like I did when I was a kid. So I wouldn't see that as being um, detrimental to my service to the PUD. I'm also a, a board member at my church. I go to Free Church Unitarian in Blaine. Um, I, again, I don't see that taking away from, um, from my service to the PUD. Uh, we meet once a month, um, hour and a half, the lovely meeting. <laughs> um, I like to hike, spend time outdoors, um, which just gives me, you know, more passion for conserving the environment. You know, I don't, there's, there's nothing that I do that would, would take away from serving, uh, the PUD. Great, thank you. So we'll start with Jamie. Uh, what was the last PUD meeting you went to and how many PUD meetings have you been to? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I actually haven't been to any of the PUD meetings in person. Um, they, they started filming them um, I guess it was been, it's been like a year ago now, maybe a little more than that. And so I watch from home. Um, I also, um, go over, you know, they post on their website, all of their agenda items and, um, their minutes, that sort of thing. So I like to keep up to date that way. Um, I know where they're located. They're actually doing hybrid sessions now. So um, they're, you know, they do it at the office on Trig Road. And again, I, I haven't been in person just because at this time it's so convenient um, now that they're recorded to, um, to watch the recordings. I kind of, I, I like to watch them in about one and a half times. It's sometimes it's a little, it's a little slow for me. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you how many that I've, I've watched. Um, it is something that I frequently like to look over um, in my spare time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric, what was the last PUD meeting you went to and how many PUD meetings have you been to? Well, I haven't actually been to any PUD meetings in person as well, like Jamie. I I watch them at I watch them at home. Um, I'll be honest; I don't watch all of them every time, but I do when I do watch them. And there are things that I'm interested in. I watch them a couple of times. Um, I did go to a meet and greet um, uh, at the uh, Ferndale uh, Ferndale Convention Center a couple of months ago for the PUD. 
and um, was able to talk to a number of people who uh, not just interested in the PUD, but worked at the PUD, uh, was able to get an, a, a good feel for uh, some of the big big issues going on. But yeah, uh, like like Jamie, uh, it's it's certainly nice to log in and be able to, to watch kind of at your leisure, and that's what I've done. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll start with Eric on this. Uh, what project is your top priority? If you could only pick one for the PUD, what would your top priority be? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think you know I think the top priority is um, broadband internet at this point, uh, just because um, there is such a need. You know, water and electrical will always be it it, it will always be a project. Um, it'll always be something that needs attention, but um, right now broadband internet, and I think that there's a lot of um, creative and ingenious ways that we, um, as a PUD, as multiple municipalities, as multiple um, companies and organizations and tribes can work together to, um, you know, really make uh, broadband um, accessible to everybody, as well as, um, be able to to get it to people who maybe can't afford to pay a commercial uh, or competitive rate for it. We can give the the rate reductions. So that would be that would be my my number one at this point. Okay, so moving on to Jamie, uh, what project is your top priority for the PUD? <clears throat> yeah, this is a hard question for me because I feel like we have to be able to chew gum and walk at the same time. <laughs> So I think that um, I think that broadband, um, you know, coming out of a pandemic, surviving a pandemic with you all, um, and not having high speed internet, you know, the FCC defines high speed internet as 25 megabits per second upload and three download, and we know that that's not true because we just had to, you know, do teleconferences for work, and as our children were, you know online learning and um, and it was impossible. And um, and so I understand the urgency of broadband. Um, and I, I think that we need to continue this really steady clip of making sure that broadband um, is um, quickly laid out for all of Whatcom County. And at the same time, um, you know, I've mentioned a couple, a couple of times that water is such a huge issue for, for me. I mean, it's such a huge issue for farmers who have, you know, no uncertainty or for fishermen and tribal communities worried about um, in-stream flows and whether, um, whether the Nooksack can support salmon habitat. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I would say that for me personally, water is the number one issue. Um, we don't have 20 to 40 years for an adjudication process, we need to act now. Climate, the climate is changing and in-stream flows are going to be challenging and we need to find solutions now, today, yesterday, um, to address water. Okay, thank you. We're going to go to our final question, which is really your wrap up here, uh, closing statements. Um, and we're going to, um, I think we're going to start with Eric since you got to start off very at the beginning, Jamie. So we'll we'll start with Eric here. Is there anything else that you would like to tell the audience to encourage them to vote for you? Um, yeah, I think you know, I, I have a love for Whatcom County. Been here a long time, and have really worked really hard um, in the city of Blaine for a lot of years. Work with a lot of other. Um, Work with a lot of other organizations, not just with the city of Blaine, but um, uh, on on city council. I work with other organizations and other municipalities, and and um, work with a lot of different people, and um, have built a lot of bridges that could really be uh, helpful uh, in the long term. Um, and understand the power of collaboration, right? Uh, I feel like I've got a lot of really great experience and I've got a lot of passion. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I just really have a, a passion for Whatcom County as well as public works. I wouldn't have been on the public works board for that many years as a volunteer if I didn't. And, um, it's, it's not usually a reason people go into like local city politics, you know, city council, they, they have dreams of, opening a park or cutting a ribbon for a new business. But um, for me, making sure that infrastructure is where it needs to be so we can be a stable community 
that's huge. And that's, that's one of the biggest things we've been working on for years. So I would say that, and I would just also just like to say, it's great to see 120 people out here doing this, which it was 1200, but it's great to see 120 people out here. And, um, uh, I, I appreciate your time listening to me. Thank you. And I will just note that this has been recorded. So you have the opportunity later to share the video out uh, and it will be available on a, the Bellingham City Club website. Okay, Jamie, final uh, closing statement from you and include, is there anything that you'd like to tell the audience to encourage them to vote for you? Um, I felt called to run for this position because I want to serve my community. I've spent the majority of my career in service to my community, either through housing programs or providing mental and behavioral health services. I'm the only candidate with firsthand experience working with the commercial fishing industry and working with farmers, um, managing that delicate balance between water availability for, for both of those industries. Uh, my father worked for Blaine Public Works for 32 years. Um, as a water quality specialist and operator. My brother is a senior operator at the Grand Coulee Dam. In a lot of ways, public works is, it's in my bones. Um, I'm also from here. I'm a local candidate. I understand the unique needs of my community and believe that I can get more stakeholders to the table to discuss the issues we're facing. I know um, I was outed as the Democrat, which I am. Um, but, you know, I've also, um, I've been here for a long time and I have a lot of conservative friends and I've already been, you know, reaching across aisles to discuss the problems that we're facing. Um, I'm in endorsed by Lummi Nation, the Whatcom Democrats, the Riveters Collective, and the 42nd Legislative District Democrats. Uh, you can learn more about my campaign on my website, jamiearnett.com. Um, I'd be honored to earn your vote. Okay, thank you very much for your candid remarks. We really do appreciate the opportunity to get to know you and your positions a little better. Um, we are going to be switching over now to our candidates for the Washington State Senate District 42. So thank you to Jamie Arnett and Eric Davidson for being here with us at City Club today. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, well, we get our screens transferred to our other candidates. I just want to uh, introduce, we have uh, Senator Simon Sefcik here. He was appointed to replace uh, Senator Erickson. And we also have our current state representative, Sharon Shoemake here. Uh, she is now, of course, running for the Senate position. Uh, they both agree to go by their first names just to make it easy on me while we're doing this uh, conversation here. So thank you for that. And uh, as we did just earlier, we're going to launch right in uh, with some questions prepared by the City Club Programming Committee. I encourage folks to uh, type questions into the Q&A um, that I will uh, attempt to get to all of them. Um, we may run out of time and I'll have to pick and choose topics that we haven't covered yet. Um, we're gonna start off by going uh, alphabetical by uh, last name um, first. So that means that we start with, um, oh my gosh, I put them out of order. Isn't that terrible? Um, so here we go. I can I can do this. <laughs> Simon, I think I did it. This is funny. You guys are two double S's um, here. So you really tripped me up. Okay, I'm sorry, but I apparently went by first name on my sheet and I've got to stick with that in order to not screw me up for the whole time. So Sharon, <laughs> we are going to start. Um, what about your previous experience and background makes you well suited to serve in the Senate? Why are you interested in running for office? Yeah, so I am the only economist in the legislature. Not only that, I'm an agricultural economist, which we know is a huge industry in this area. I think it's an important skill in a rural district to think through issues like inflation. Um, I've both saved and killed bills by simply explaining inflationary concerns through things like antitrust, the incredible economics of early learning, and my passions of affordable housing and energy policy. You know, there's a lot of times in those caucus rooms where the 
politicians are talking to each other. And maybe we agree on values and goals, but we don't agree on whether or not, say, X causes Y. And so, you know, in normal situations, when you're at the dinner table, just like in the caucus room, um, maybe you just fight over it and you rest on your own biases. Well, I actually go and get the evidence. Um, so a great example of that was a project on Swift Creek to remove some naturally occurring asbestos. Um, there were a lot of concerns about this. It's it's a complicated issue, um, and there are some concerns about what really is the impact of this asbestos. Can it really get into the creek, and what happens when it falls up on people's backyards or in farms? So I called a geologist who was working on the issue, and I was able to get the information I needed from him. I was able to bring it to the appropriate committee chairs, and we were able to get funding for that. Um, I also have experience as a teacher, so it's really helpful when half our education half our state budget is over half of it's on education. Um, I've lived a variety of life experiences. I'm a mom and I'm a wife. Um, I'm also really honest. I work across party lines. I'm definitely not an ideologue. And I'll be honest, I never thought I'd be in politics. It, I'm probably one of the more accidental. Sharon, I have to get you to stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, Simon, what about your previous experience and background makes you well suited to serve in the Senate? Why are you interested in running for office? Well, Christine, thank you so much for the question. And thank you to the Bellingham City Club and all those that are watching for taking time out of your day on a beautiful sunny day like this to, to engage in this process. This is important, what we're doing. I'm Simon Sefcik. I'm your local state senator here. And I'm running for office because I believe that Olympia desperately needs a new energetic and empathetic voice for our future. I think that the approach of the past is not necessarily going to work for new families that are moving into Whatcom County. I think that we need to return affordability back to Whatcom County. We need to restore public safety in our streets, and we need to rebuild accountability in government. If you look at Sharon Shoemake's record, you see a record that is very partisan and that has made all of these subjects and areas worse uh, year by year. And so I believe that we need a new approach to Whatcom County. You know, this is not something that I thought that I would be doing at this stage of life, uh, but I've always believed that people who love their community can make a difference and improve it in incredible ways. That's why in the legislative session, I fought for the people of the 42nd district. I championed policies to give money back to the people of Whatcom County. And yet, despite a $16 billion plus budget surplus, the majority party didn't spend money on immediate tax release that comes into effect this year. The fact of the matter is that the current approach in Olympia is not working for the average family in Whatcom County, which is why I believe we need to go back to principles that work for our communities. We need to make housing more affordable. We need to give our law enforcement the tools they need to do their job. And we need to institute emergency powers reform in the legislature. Okay, moving on to our next question. This time we will start with Simon. Uh, given that inflation is a worldwide problem, what legislation would you sponsor to support or support to help local consumers? Well, you know, that that's a great question. Uh, one of the first uh, bills that I sponsored during the legislative session was a, a bill to temporarily suspend the state gas tax. You know, we had a $16 billion budget surplus. This would have been a way to save consumers about 50 cents per gallon of gas for uh, for, for the rest of the year. And the majority party said no, even though the Wharton School of Finance has done studies to say that this is a successful approach, even though other states have been able to do this approach successfully and give tax relief to those who need it most. In fact, in this very form two years ago, Representative Shoemake advocated for a 1% decrease in the sales tax until the rest of the year. That was actually something that, that those in my caucus supported and something the majority party said no to. So the fact of the matter is that we do need tax relief and we do need to provide it to, to consumers. We need to support our small businesses. And that's why more and more regulations that make it harder for people to find a job. That's why regulations that impose burdens on businesses end up pricing people, not just out of their homes, but from this county itself. So I think we need new approaches that make it easier for businesses, easier for workers, and easier for employers. We have a huge workforce shortage crisis as well in Whatcom County and across Washington state. And so we need to find new pathways to encourage a new workforce approach. But what isn't going to work are more taxes. The fact of the matter is that 22 new taxes have been passed since Sharon Shoemake was elected in 2018. That approach is not good for the people of Whatcom County. That's why we need tax relief and we need affordability in Washington state. Okay, Sharon, I'll repeat the question. 
Given that inflation is a worldwide problem, what legislation would you sponsor or support to help local consumers? Yeah, thank you. And thank you to Senator Subsick for pointing out that I do support a 1% decrease in sales tax. One of the things that I'd like to see is a changing of the way that we decide to tax people. The way when we rely on sales tax and property taxes, it ends up falling predominantly on working people. And so of those 22 taxes, I probably voted against a lot of them. But some of the ones that I did vote for were ones that cut taxes on working people and raise them on the very wealthy. An example of something that was in a mailer was I cut taxes on people People selling homes that are less than 1.5 million, and we raised it for those selling more than 1.5 million, and that threshold changes over time. Um, so we do have money for schools, we do have money for social services. That's really, really important to having a functioning modern economy. Is making sure that we're taking care of one another, that we're providing affordable housing for those who wouldn't be able to afford it, but also looking at private sector solutions. Generally, you have to look at when we look at inflation, we have to look at the causes. So some of those are grander macroeconomic things, such as the war in Ukraine, causing an increase in the price of energy. Um, some of the other pieces are supply chain hiccups, and there's definitely some work that we can do on that. Um, we have a supply chain caucus that has been examining this. I'm one of the members of it. And one of the things we did last session was figuring out ways that we can help out some of the um, truck drivers with things like providing access to restrooms, safe places for them to sleep at night and hold their rigs, and looking at ways that we can get more people with with those commercial driver's license so they can do this work and we don't see that the prices are quite as high. Okay, give you a chance to catch your breath because you're up next for this question, Sharon. Uh, here in Whatcom County, we perceive an increase in crime. How do, you how do you plan to address this both locally and across the state? Yeah, so I have a I've been working a lot on this as a kind of a pillar approach. So I think the police legislation that we passed in 2020 is a helpful example of government being responsive. Um, but I also think that we passed some bills that we thought did one thing, but then the police chiefs and lawyers and other disagreed when it came time to implement the laws. And they told us we made mistakes. The fact is, um, laws have unintended consequences, and we went back and fix them. Um, I think going forward, what we need to do is we need to try and look at well, what creates criminality. Um, and one the things that we see is in a criminal justice system, you need consequences that are swift, certain, and fair. One of the things that a, um, a criminologist said is if you're looking at a nationwide increase in crime, you have to have a nationwide explanation for why. And one of those nationwide explanations for why is the closure of the courts during COVID. We saw that in communities that had their courts closed for longer, they had a higher increase in crime than communities that had their courts closed for less time. And so I've been working on a proposal to try and get some more judges in Whatcom County. Right now, we have four superior court judges. That's the same amount of Skagit, despite the fact that we have twice as many people here in Whatcom County. We need to make sure that people can get through this judicial system in a swift, certain, and fair manner. Otherwise, they go back out to the street and they keep committing crimes. We also need to make sure that we have enough police officers. My opponent voted no on extra money for funding to do the basic law enforcement academy when he voted against the budget. When you vote against the budget, you vote against everything in the budget. We also, I want to work on a regional training academy to help get more police officers trained. Okay, thank you. I'll repeat the question for you, Simon. Um, here in Whatcom County, we perceive an increase in crime. How do you plan to address this both locally and across the state? Well, I'm, I'm so glad I get a chance to, to respond to that because in this very same form, yet again, two years ago, Sharon Shoemake told all of you that besides beating the pandemic, her number one priority was to fix the systemic racism in our court system because she said it was based on 400 years of inequity. She then proceeded to vote for some of the most restrictive anti-police legislation in, in the country, including a legislation that handicaps our law enforcement basic ability to do their job, which I'm glad she now acknowledges is a mistake and that she voted the wrong way, but we need to think about the damage that those votes caused on our community. It's why if you go and call your local police chief, they will tell you that they had conversations with Representative Shoemake. They asked her not to support that legislation, but she didn't listen and she did so and voted for those laws anyways. 
So we have to, to first acknowledge the, the facts when it comes to those issues. That's why I'm the only candidate in this race endorsed by law enforcement organizations. So if Sharon Schumacher is going to tell you that I haven't supported law enforcement because I voted against a $60 billion budget that didn't prioritize any tax relief, I would ask her why WACOPS has endorsed me, not her. Why the Washington Association of Police Chiefs and Sheriffs has endorsed me and not her. The fact of the matter is that we need to address these issues. We need to restore police pursuits. We need to address the Blake decision and add the word intentionally to our drug statutes. But ultimately, what you need most is a candidate and a legislator that will actually listen rather than follow along on partisan lines and then admit once she's made the mistake uh, that, oops, maybe we'll fix it next time. Okay, we're going to move to our next question. And this time we'll start with Simon. Governor Inslee has promised to give sanctuary to any person seeking abortion care and services in our state. Do you support or oppose this position? Well, thank you for the question. I think it's important to acknowledge, obviously, that this is a sensitive subject and, and we need to, to be compassionate as we discuss you know, something that, that is, is complicated. Uh, the answer is no. I don't believe that Washington state taxpayers uh, should be spending uh, their money uh, to, to fund those uh, out-of-state services uh, for those that don't live in the area. And, and that's because I'm committed, like I said, to returning affordability to, to Washington state. And I don't think this would be a, a great use of our taxpayer dollars. Uh, you know, my campaign and the focus of my campaign is on returning affordability, on restoring public safety and rebuilding accountability in government. And so that's why I think that this type of approach is an exact example of, of where government spending doesn't make sense. And so, no, I would rather uh, use, use that money, again, prioritizing tax relief uh, to, to the people of Whatcom County. You know, Sharon Shoemake, again, going back for a second, said that she does support a 1% sales tax reduction. Well, then why wasn't any legislation proposed about that from the majority party on that subject? Why is it that despite a $16 billion budget surplus, uh, Sharon Shoemake and, and her party didn't spend any time actually working towards tax relief for, for businesses. And so we, we can talk about these things, but we have to actually compare somebody's rhetoric and their record. And when we do so, we see that facts are stubborn things, and the facts are very different from the speeches uh, that we've heard during a campaign cycle. Okay, I'll repeat the question for you, Sharon. Governor Inslee has promised to give sanctuary to any person seeking abortion care and services in our state. Do you support or oppose this position? I support the governor on this. Um, I do believe that sanctuary does not mean that we're going to increase taxes. It means that we won't prosecute women who get abortions here, um, or we won't work with states like Missouri that have criminalized women in their reproductive decisions. What you didn't hear from Simon is whether or not he supports or opposes abortion. There's a reason why Republicans are running on this. Um, we have one of the most pro-choice states in the nation, and I think we need to be honest about where we stand on women's rights. There is no reason politicians in Olympia need to be making decisions that women and their doctor are better off deciding on. And you're not seeing any clear answers from Republicans. And I think that that's pretty typical right now of the Republican discussions. What you're hearing from Senator Subzik is a tax on me, a tax on things the majority party has tried to do. And he's trying to conflate the two. I am a Democrat. I'm a little bit of a weird Democrat because I'm an economist and I don't control everything that happens in Olympia. Furthermore, he was in Olympia the past year, and he could have gotten some of these things done as well, especially in the state Senate. One of the things that we did last session was we codified abortion access in 1851. Simon Sevzik voted against it, and he never really explained why. He made technical reasons why, and I have not been able to pin him down in a clear and concise manner on his position on abortion. Sharon, we'll start with you. What is your assessment of election integrity in Washington state and nationally? Yeah, so Kim Wyman um, has praised the security of our elections here in Washington state. And Kim Wyman is a Republican. I think most people know that watching this. Um, I really love mail-in voting. I love that families sit down with the voter guide and they sit and they talk about civics. They talk about public policy. I think this results in better decisions and better politics. I am deeply worried about Trump-fueled conspiracy theories about our election. It's scary. It's un-American. 
Um, some of these activities that we've seen, like putting drop boxes under surveillance, it's a tactic to intimidate voters, and it's simply not okay. Um, I want to make sure that when we're thinking about a voting system, we're not just thinking about something that's going to get Democrats elected or Republicans or independents elected. We need to think about a voting system and a set of institutions that make sure that when my kids are grown and when they're making decisions, they're able to have their voices heard. So that's why I support some innovations like ranked choice voting, which I think results in a better politics that results in allowing third parties to be having to discussions. And I've done this bipartisan with Republican representatives looking at better ways to vote and maybe not having such aggressive discussions as we're seeing today from Simon Subsick. Okay, thank you. I'll move to Simon. Simon, what is your assessment of election integrity in Washington state and nationally? Well, I'm not sure what aggressive conversations I've had about uh, election integrity, so I, I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, but, you know, generally, of course, I, I do believe that our election system needs to be accessible and it needs to be safe and, and it needs to be fair. And so I think any, any steps that we can make to, to make voting both more accessible and more safe and more secure are absolutely steps uh, that need to be taken. Uh, you know, I, I do need to go back though to, to Sharon's claim that, you know, I had a year to, to focus on some of those things. And Sharon is absolutely right. That's why I did prioritize tax relief. She didn't. That's why I did vote to restore public safety with some of our police laws when Sharon voted for the very laws that handicap our law enforcement. At the same time, Representative Shoemaker is saying that, that politicians shouldn't be able to mandate personal health decisions when for the past two years, Sharon Shoemaker was silent, when your friends lost their jobs, when businesses got shut down, when firefighters and police officers lost their jobs over personal health care decisions that they, they made, where was Sharon Shoemaker for you? And the answer is she didn't show up for you. And so uh, again, we, we do need to focus on not just what we say we're going to do, but our actual voting record, our actual experience, and our, our actual record of working for the people, listening to the people of the 42nd Legislative District. And so whether it is in the process of elections or whether it's in affordability and public safety, we have to prioritize the people of Whatcom County, not uh, what, what has been the majority party's approach in Olympia that hasn't worked for the people of the 42nd Legislative District. Okay, I'm moving to some questions from our audience. Um, and we had this for the PUD as well. Uh, if, and again, we'll start with Simon. Um, if an opposing political action committee publishes false info, would you uh, publicly disavow that publication? Yes, of, of course, I, I would be happy to. Uh, you know, to be honest, I don't spend most of my time uh, reading through what other uh, outside political action committees are, are saying about me uh, or about my opponent. I do focus on what my opponent says about me. Sharon Shoemaker has falsely stated that I've gotten a quote unquote big old check for my campaign from the NRA. Sharon Shoemaker knows that that is not true. So I'll give her the opportunity right now to take that statement back. Sharon Shoemaker blamed Republicans for filibustering on the governor's emergency powers reform when she knows that that's not true. So, so maybe now she'll take that statement back. You know, the, the fact of the matter is that we do need to, to tell the truth in our election system. Sharon Shoemaker said that I had, quote, no role when it came to flood relief, when even Sharon Shoemaker's own seatmate, Alicia Rule, said that that wasn't true when the author of the Senate budget Budget gave me credit for working for the people of Whatcom County on flood relief. So not only, you know, would I expect us to disavow when, when PACs are making false statements about each other, I, I would hope that Sharon Shoemaker would retract those false statements that she's made about me that have both been disputed by members of her own party, by her own seatmate, by the author of the Senate budget, and by others in the community. And so absolutely, you as voters have, have an obligation, and we as candidates have an obligation to tell the truth to you, even when it's inconvenient. And, and that has been the goal of my campaign. I will continue to do so, and, and I would be happy to. And so if, if there are those discrepancies, I'd be more than happy to, to look over them and, and assess whether or not they're, they're true or untrue. Okay, I will repeat the question for Sharon. Uh, if an opposing political action committee publishes false info, would you publicly disavow the publication? Absolutely. And in fact, I did that when I ran against Simon's mom two years ago. It wasn't even false information. It was just unfair information that was an attack ad for attacking her from being Texas, from being from Texas and basically wealthy. And I stood up and I said that I don't think that's appropriate. Um, 
again, I don't think voters are really interested in the back and forth and personal grievances of the two of us, but I would like to point out that what I was talking about with the NRA check is a scholarship that Simon got, and you can find the picture of him receiving a big check from the NRA. That is true. Um, the other thing, too, is that when he originally placed money in the budget for in the state budget and the Senate side, it was for Whatcom County. It was later replaced with statewide funding directed to the Department of Military. To call it Whatcom County flood funding was a bit of a stretch. And to make that worse, he actually voted against it. You can't say no on the budget and then claim to have supported what is in the budget. It's not a question of who takes credit for flood funding. It's a question of really being honest with your constituents. Um, some of the other things that I think are really important to discuss here are just making sure that we're having a campaign about the issues and not, again, this back and forth and this, this grievance politics, which I think people are just so tired of from the last few years. It's important to know where your politicians stand. It's important to make sure there's accountability and people are always welcome to come and ask me questions. I will give you clear answers on where I stand on criminal justice reform, on abortion, on education funding, on flood relief. Christine, am I allowed to respond to that? Unfortunately, no, we just go to each question. We'll have the summary at the end if you wish to go there. Great. Um, that's a good note. It, we have so many questions. If we could stick to the issue at each question would be great. Um, so I think we're back at Sharon starting. Um, this question is, do you think steps should be taken in, le in the legislature to limit the emergency powers of the governor? Yes. Um, we spent the last few years under emergency power. Some of the decisions I agreed with, some of them I didn't agree with. Some of them I fought through official channels to make sure that we lessened or we made space for a lot of the businesses that we really needed to work through. Um, as a result of that time, there are absolutely accommodations and things that we've learned. You always learn when you go through an extraordinary experience like this. So I know what Simon's going to say here. He's going to attack me for calling it a filibuster. What happened is a Democrat on the Senate side sent over an emergency powers bill. We talked about it on the House. We were, Democrats were ready to vote for it. We had the votes. We were willing to work with the Republicans on making some of those amendments to emergency powers. I know Republicans felt like we weren't going far enough, and I get that. I might have felt differently if it had been a Republican governor in charge um, who wasn't prioritizing public health. So what happened during that uh, floor debate is towards the end of session, especially, we're starting to run out of time and important bills that matter to people die because we simply don't have enough time. And the Republicans were clear that they wanted to debate every single amendment using almost all their speakers and take up a lot of time. So I would have liked to vote yes on some reform of emergency powers, but the amount of time that the House Republicans were taking, not Simon Sefcik, but House Republicans were taking, just meant that we weren't gonna be able to pass other things that were also important. And so we pulled the bill, leadership pulled the bill. Okay, Simon, I'll repeat the question. Do you think that steps should be taken in the legislature to limit the emergency powers of the governor? Well, well, thank you for the question and, and thank you for, for the explanation. Um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm glad that Sharon Shoemaker and I agree on this issue. And, you know, my hope is that, uh, you know, Sharon and I can come regardless of, of who the governor is, whether it is a Republican or Democrat, and, and agree that there need to be checks and balances on the executive branch from the legislature. So so I'm glad to hear that, that that's her approach. You know, I think the, the more ironic thing was just that Representative Shoemake said that only after the bill died. And you can put a bill up. I think the bill was put up at about 1 a.m. There was about 30 minutes of debate on the bill. And then the majority party pulled it and said that there were other things that were of a higher focus. I think that this is of a very, very high importance. This goes to the very heart of what it means to have a constitutional government, to have a system of checks and balances, wherein the executive branch is checked by the legislature. And so, you know, there were a lot of mispriorities. Not only did the majority party consider this not to be important enough, they didn't think tax relief was important enough or public safety or vehicular pursuits or, or even education in many ways. And so I think that this really goes to showing that Representative Shoemake's answer, rather than to place some of the blame on, on her own party, was instead to say it was Republicans' fault for filibustering the bill, even when Representative Shoemake knows full well there is no even filibuster technically in, in the House. And so this is an example of finding a way to blame the Republican Party, because it's easier to blame the Republicans than to sometimes own up to the mistakes of, of your own party. Okay. 
We're going to move on. We have several questions related to education, so I'm going to try to condense them into one here, um, and we'll start with Simon on that. Um, let's see. How do you think that the state should support public schools in terms of both funding and policies? Uh, how would you advocate for local children in Olympia? Well, you know, this is a really exciting and important topic because it is obviously not only the, the paramount duty of, of our state here in Washington, but we're seeing, uh, and, and I know Sharon is, is a teacher at Western. She could speak to this, I know. Uh, we're seeing all sorts of learning loss coming out of the pandemic. We're seeing uh, difficulties in education as people as, as much as I like Zoom webinars like this, Christine, I think we both know that, you know, in-person classes, for example, are, are much better. And so I think one of our first steps needs to be to, to addressing the learning loss that came uh, from the COVID pandemic. And, and I, was, I was happy to support uh, Representative Alicia Rule's bill to help provide more mental health counseling uh, for students that are making up for the learning loss or that may uh, be experiencing all sorts of, of different issues coming out of COVID. And so I think we need to continue to do that. We have to make sure that education is funded in a responsible manner, because the, the other unfortunate fact, of course, is that uh, Washington State is not necessarily performing particularly well right now in K through 12 uh, academically. You know, I believe Washington State had the lowest mathematics performance in the country uh, earlier this year, according to a report. And so the, those are issues that, that say we need to make sure uh, that our academics are rigorous. We need to make sure that we're teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, and also providing some of those learning tools to help people come out of a very, very difficult pandemic. And I think this is an issue where, where both sides have, have many points of agreement because we need to make sure that we are equipping children with an education that will lead them to the future. And that's what I want to do. Sharon, I will repeat the question for you. How do you think that the state should support public schools in terms of both funding and policies? Um, what would you do to advocate for local children in Olympia? Yeah, so I've heard Simon criticizing Washington State schools a few times. And so I looked into the numbers of where we stood before the pandemic. It's really hard to think about that after the pandemic because so many things happened. And we are generally above average or at average on the national report cards. Um, I do support a strong, well-funded public education system. Washington State should be a shining example for other states. And I want to ensure that, you know, given this chaos that we've had with the COVID-19 um, and the disruptions and learning about how severe it is for kids to be outside of the schools, we have a lot of work to do. Um, learning loss has to be addressed and that takes money and staff. And when we voted to stabilize school funding, my opponent voted no. That was essential to keeping schools open and it was $7.5 million to Whatcom schools just to keep our schools open. Um, I've had experience teaching in the public school system. My kids are right now and I've learned so much from my kids' teachers, from pre-K, and in a few days, my oldest will be starting third grade. Every kid deserves a high-quality, age-appropriate education from birth through vocational schools or college with mental health supports. Alicia Rule did fantastic work there, and opportunities that really bring out their best qualities, whether it's learning to weld, doing art, playing sports, being an FFA, or being a nerd like me on the math team. Thank you. Uh, next question, we'll start with Sharon. Do you support universal health care for Washington State? Yeah, I do support universal health care. And I had an experience with universal health care personally. So I have two kids. One was the second one was born at St. Joe's. The first one was born in England, where my husband's from. Well, he's from Scotland. Um, and so when I had a baby in England, um, what happened is I didn't see a doctor up until I was actually giving birth. Here, I saw a doctor once a week towards the end of my pregnancy. And that was kind of silly because it's really expensive. The doctor's time is much more expensive than a midwife's time, and especially for a low risk pregnancy. The other thing that was really different in the United Kingdom was after I gave the baby, I had someone come to my house within 24 hours. They checked my C-section scar, they weighed the baby, they made sure he was eating, they calmed us down. Um, her advice for everything was to put breast milk or olive oil on it. And there were all these amazing services to support me as a new mom and a new with a new family. And that was incredible. Here, it's six weeks later and hope that you didn't have postpartum depression. And so when we look at the numbers, I think this story is actually really illustrative. In America, we do what you can bill for. 
Often that's expensive and it increases the cost of what we pay, especially through our system of trying to figure out insurance and fight through all these processes. In the UK, they do what is actually effective and good for your health. So that's not seeing a doctor once a week towards the end of your pregnancy. It's making sure that you know, you have midwives available and you have the supports you need. And so if we look at other countries, they get better results and spend less money with a universal system of healthcare. Okay, I will move to Simon and I'll repeat the question. Uh, do you support universal health care for Washington State? The, the answer to the question is, is generally no, and, and that's for several reasons. First, of course, I'll note, Sharon, you win. I don't think I would have been able to compete on the math team. So uh, I'm sure you're, you're uh, a lot better in math than I am in that regards. Uh, but of course, when, when it comes to, to universal health care, I think one of the most difficult conversations is how do we actually fund this project and, and how much would it cost? And the answer that I hear most of the time from uh, the majority party on this subject is through some sort of elevated income tax. Sharon Shoemake said two years ago that she does not support an income tax. She said she respects the people of Whatcom County because we voted multiple times and the people of, of Washington State have voted uh, 11 times to reject an income tax. And yet the very next year, Sharon Shoemake supported a capital gains income tax which is an income tax. The IRS has noted that it's an income tax. The Washington State Department of Commerce ob observed or implicated that, that it was an income tax. And it, it's one that you know, we're, we're seeing through the court system has, has been determined to be unconstitutional. We'll obviously have to see what happens. And so when it comes to, to universal health care, I think the question is, how do we actually fund it? And I, I don't support, obviously, an income tax, unlike uh, Sharon Shoemake. And I think that right now there are better alternatives that we can take. I'm a member Member on the health care committee in the Senate. And there are other steps that we can take to reduce health care prices and streamline our process in, in hospitals that will address this issue without imposing extraordinarily high taxes and making Washington state unable to compete economically. Okay, we are getting to the end of our afternoon together. Um, so we're going to have time now uh, for a closing statement. We'll start with Simon Sefcik. Is there anything else you would like to tell the audience to encourage them to vote for you? Well, well I'd like to thank uh, you, Christine, for, for hosting this, the Bellingham City Club. And, and I'd like to thank uh, Sharon Shoemake, because I think these conversations do make our process stronger. I, I think it's, it's why forums and debates are important, because it allows you to see a, a contrast. I believe truly in those three things that I talked about, returning affordability, restoring public safety, and rebuilding accountability. I wish we would have had time to talk about housing because I think Sharon and I are both passionate about that subject as well. The question is, how do we actually achieve it? How do we uh, achieve these things in Whatcom County? I'm running for office because I want to be a new voice for our future in Whatcom County. I do believe the most important quality that you can bring is a real ability to listen, to learn from one another, and to work with each other to solve our common problems. And that's what I was working on during the legislative session. That's what I'm continuing to do. That's why I sit down and I talk to our police chiefs about public safety. It's why I go and I walk in downtown Ferndale and talk to our small business owners, because you can read a book about something, you can study it all you want. But when you actually go in and learn and live those experiences, that's the best education that you can receive from hearing from people firsthand on how to improve our situation in Whatcom County. My champion, my, my record has been to champion you in Whatcom County, and that's what I'm going to continue to champion. I don't think that the approach of the past to increase taxes, to restrict our law enforcement, and to not properly fund education is going to work for the people of the 42nd Legislative District. And that's why I work for you, and I will continue to work for you to solve these issues. Okay. Sharon, this is now your chance for a closing statement. Is there anything else you would like to tell the audience to encourage them to vote for you? Yeah, I think one of the things that you've seen is that you'll always get a straight answer from me, whether it's on public safety, climate change, abortion. And I still don't know where Simon stands on abortion, despite it being a common question in the Q&A. Republicans all across the state are running away from this issue of abortion because they know this is one of the most pro-choice states. And every year, Republicans introduce bans to get up to ban abortion, um, often without consideration for the women's health. And they are never heard because Republicans, because Democrats hold the gavel. That's why Republicans are pouring 
pouring money into this district to try and buy the Senate seat, and we're not going to let it work. I want to thank City Club for putting this together. Our civic institutions were severely tested these last four years, and your vote doesn't just impact the next four years, but the health of our democracy as well. That's why I'm so glad the audience is also here answering questions and showing that engagement that really makes our system work. And maybe it's in the teacher in me, but I just love having these discussions. And I got to say, COVID has made things hard. Our economy right now is fragile. There is unprecedented struggles from mental health, from learning, et cetera. And as the economist in the legislature, the only economist in the legislature, I have experienced not just in politics, but in life that I will bring to the state Senate. I want to spend the next four years working on housing, figuring out how private market solutions to allow us to build more in cities. I will make the case over and over again to find data-driven solutions that work across party lines. I am one of the most bipartisan legislators in the legislature, AWB told me that, and that improve our economy and our public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. So I want to thank both uh, Senator Sefcik and Representative Shoemake for being here this afternoon and answering our questions from City Club. And we are expecting uh, to do more candidate forums uh, in September. So uh, join us then to hear from um, our other candidates. Thank you again for being here today and uh, take care. Thank you again for having us. Really, really appreciate it. Bye, y'all.